Good morning, church. Welcome to the game of life. Your objective is to collect money and life tiles and have the highest dollar amount at the end of the game. On your turn, spin the wheel and then move your car the number of spaces on the spinner. Always move your car forward in the direction of the arrows. And just like in real life, you can't go back in time. If you land on an occupied space, move ahead to the next open space. These are generally not the words spoken to us on the day we are born. It is, however, somewhat of an unspoken expectation. Welcome to life. In a nutshell, your job is to grow up, get an education, to raise money, and to someday retire. Sound like fun? I didn't think so. Life is not a game. Life is real. And at the end of the game, it's not who has the most money that wins. The real winners are those who have Jesus Christ. Friends, our lives will go through a series of changes as we grow older. From the moment we are born, we are dependent upon others for our care and for our basic needs. And as we grow and as we become more autonomous, we often go through a season of rebellion, pushing the boundaries just to see how far we can go. As we mature, many people pursue some type of work or a career and enter a season of producing. And in our later years, we look back on our life and we reflect on all that has been And seek perhaps to offer counsel and share that wisdom with the younger generations. Our Christian journey can be similarly characterized. There is great excitement when we accept Christ as our Savior. But we find ourselves dependent upon other Christians to determine our next steps. And to learn more about becoming a disciple. Some people will rebel. And will either fall away from the faith or they will push the limits of God's forgiveness. Some people come back having gained some life experience and receiving heaps and piles of grace upon their return. And they enter a productive phase pursuing others and witnessing in Jesus' name. As we age, we too We'll reflect back upon our walk and our time with God and our seasons with God. And we can find ourselves filled with that same wisdom, just waiting to impart to the next generation of God's children. Through every season, God is a constant presence and God's work and grace remain with us. No matter where life takes us, no matter how old we become, God can still use our lives to reflect his light and his love. Life is not a game. It is so very real and we only get one. What will you do with yours? The first step of our lives is the act of arriving. And by virtue of the fact that you are sitting in this room today, that means that there was a day on which you were born. For many, our birthday was a day that brought great joy to the lives of our families. Or for those of you who may have been adopted, your birth provided joy to the parents who would come to call you their own. And as we age, some of us look less forward to birthdays because it means that we're one year older. I was recently attending a stewardship banquet with Stanley and heard a sermon. And and the the district superintendent who was preaching gave an analogy of life in a a series of a, a game broken into quarters. And he talked about some in their early life were in the first quarter and some were in the second quarter. And he said he was in the third quarter. And as he looked around the room, some were in the fourth quarter and others were facing sudden death. I kid. Our birthdays are important. So important, in fact, that most people celebrate with cake, candles, a song, and gifts to mark this celebratory occasion. Our physical birthdays are just one of the many arriving moments in our lifetimes. 
We have moments when we arrive at other stages and phases of life. We have moments when we arrive at the advent of our career. We have moments when we arrive at the pinnacle of our careers. We have moments when we arrive at retirement. We arrive at destinations. We arrive in the lives of others. And there are moments when others arrive in our lives. And in all these moments of arrival, we often look back and give thanks for the journey that has brought us to where we are. All of those arriving moments that have brought us where we are and made us who we are. In addition to all of these moments of arrival, there's also a moment in which many of us have recognized God's grace at work in our lives. Or perhaps you're here this morning still trying to figure out where you're at. With God. I would argue that aside from our physical birth, our moment of spiritual arrival is the second most important moment and arrival in our lives. Our physical birth secures our life on earth, our spiritual birth secures our life after our time on earth is done. Our physical lives and our spiritual lives cycle through many stages and phases, but the arriving moments give meaning to it all. And this morning, following this message, I want to give any of you in this room the opportunity to either make that first-time commitment to arrive in Jesus Christ, or if you've lost your way, an opportunity to recommit to him. So as I share this morning, if you feel that nudge, that tug, that pull on your heart, I hope that you'll take the opportunity to get your spiritual affairs in order. Friends, our spiritual arrivals have significant meaning. And just like our physical birthdays, they're cause for great celebration. We arrive, we celebrate our arrivals, but we also move on. If you have a Bible with you this morning, please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Jesus has just finished a series of teachings, including talking about the fact that his followers are the salt of the earth, that we're supposed to spice things up a little bit. And more people were gathering to hear him, including some who were grumbling about his teaching. And that's where we pick up the story in verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Please hear these words. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. And the Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. Jesus said, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and you lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness to go after the lost one until you found it? And when found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders, rejoicing. And when you got home, call your friends and your neighbors saying, come celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. I don't know about you, but one of the things I hate most in life is feeling like I'm lost. Whether it's uh, being lost traveling to some unfamiliar destination or life is handing me this series of events and I'm not real sure what to do with and there doesn't seem to be necessarily an easy path to follow or an outcome that's overly obvious. I'm not sure which way to go next. Working through that mire. And that muck associated with being lost can be tiresome. However, when we find our way, when we get back on course, or when we figure out the solution to a series of problems we've been having, it's like we gain this newfound sense of purpose. When we have direction, there seems to be this zest for getting to our destination. We want to arrive. We were lost, but we're now found. We didn't know where we were going. Now we have a direction. We were saddened and heavily burdened. And now we want to party. In this parable, Jesus is saying the same thing. When I'm driving around a town I'm unfamiliar with and get lost, I don't think about all of the cities that I do know how to navigate. I know that I can navigate other cities and places. 
and will continue to be able to do so. What's most important to me now is figuring out how to navigate this place in which I am lost. I don't rejoice that I know my way around all of the other places. I rejoice when I figure out something new. A few years ago, I was working on a project at home and I couldn't find my tape measure. And I wasn't rejoicing that all of my other tools were in the toolbox. I was frustrated and I was aggravated that I had to make a trip to the hardware store to buy a new tape measure. I knew that my other tools were still going to be in the toolbox when I needed them. It's not that they weren't important, but they weren't lost. And therefore, they were not of primary concern. And my celebration was not in what I already had. It was certainly not in what I had lost, but it was in reclaiming that which I had lost so I could complete my project. When the shepherd loses a sheep, when God loses a beloved child to the ways of the world, he goes after the one who is lost, trusting that those who are already in the fold will remain there. It's not that we're no longer important, but we've already had our moment of arrival. God is looking to continue the party by welcoming others into the fold. To drive this point forward, Jesus offers two more parables. And I think that it's important that we consider them this morning as well. Jesus taught these three parables together for a reason. And we often look at them independently from one another. But I think they gain greater meaning when we take them together. In Luke 15, 8 through 10, Jesus shares the parable of the lost coin. A woman lost a coin and she lit a lamp and she scoured the house to find it, turning everything upside down. And when she found it, she called her neighbors. She called her friends. She said, come celebrate with me. I found this lost coin. And then in Luke 15, 11 through 32, Jesus shares the parable of the prodigal son. He tells of a man who had two sons and the younger one who said to his father, dad, I want right now. I want right now what's coming to me, what's mine. So the father divided the property between them. And it wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a diff different country. And there, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted his entire inheritance. So he made up his mind to return home and he apologized to his father. And he's coming down the lane. His father saw him and his heart was pounding and he ran out and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son started the speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to ever be called your son again. But the father wasn't listening. He called to the servants, quick, bring, bring a clean set of clothes and dress and put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then get the grain fed heifer and roast it. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead, is now alive, given up for lost and is now found. So they had this wonderful party. And meanwhile, the older son was out in the field. And when the day's work was done, he came in. And as he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the house servants over and he said, what's going on? And the house servant said, your brother came home. And your father's ordered a celebration. And the older brother refused to join in. And the dad went out and he tried to get the older son to participate. And the son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving you. Never giving you one moment of grief. But you've never thrown a party for me. And then this son of yours who's thrown away your money, squandered it all, wasted it, shows up and you go all out with a feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time. Everything that I have is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead and he's now alive. He was lost, but he's now found. In each of these parables, something was lost and then it was found. Something was not there and then there was this great moment of arrival followed by a celebration. In 1980, R&B group Cool in the Gang released a song titled Celebration, a chart-topping tune that's easily recognized by anyone who's heard it. And the main verse of the song says there's a party going on right here, a celebration to last throughout the years. So bring your good times, your laughter too. We're going to celebrate your party with you. When the shepherd found the lost sheep, when the woman found the lost coin, and when the son came home to meet his father, there was a party going on there, my friends. 
It was a celebration of epic proportions to last throughout all time. When we're born, there's a party. And we celebrate that party every year to commemorate our birthdays. When we receive and accept Jesus Christ into our hearts and into our lives, heaven throws a party because someone who was lost has returned home. The problem is, and the song names it, there's a party going on right here. And the desire is to have it last and last throughout the years. Friends, I know several people who have repeated their 29th or 39th birthday celebration for several years in a row. (laughs) Doesn't stop them from aging. Parties are a great thing, but they come to an end. And trying to keep them going perpetually is exactly the opposite of what Jesus is trying to get at in these parables. Yes, yes, we should throw a party when someone arrives. But Jesus doesn't want us to keep the party going for ourselves. He wants us to move the party to new locations and celebrate more arrivals. Too many people in today's world get stuck in the arriving stage and they never move on. They try to keep their party going despite the fact that the music stopped, the lights went out and everyone went home a long time ago. When someone gets stuck in the arriving stage, it usually manifests itself in consumerist language, especially when referencing worship or church ministries. They say that they don't like this or that, and church becomes more about personal preference and less about advancing the kingdom. People who get stuck in the arriving stage often end up questioning what the church can do for them rather than asking what they can do so that God could throw a party for someone else. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, Jesus encounters a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Now, if you remember from a few weeks ago, Pharisees see things in very defined terms. They don't see shades of gray very well. And in this example, Nicodemus is trying to cognitively process Jesus' words that unless someone is born from above, they will not be able to understand, let alone see glimpses of the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't understand how someone who had a physical birth could be born again. And Jesus said, when you look at a baby, it's just that. A body you can look at and touch. The spirit becomes a living spirit. In other words, to inherit God's kingdom, we have to make room for God's spirit to dwell within us. We have to be born from above. The spirit of God has to be brought forth within us. We need to recognize our lostness in order to be found and to take shelter in the grace of God. Nicodemus chose to continue questioning and Jesus finally gave up and said, you're just going to remain stuck. He didn't want to grow. He didn't want to expand his horizons. He wanted to stay right where he was. Nicodemus didn't want to grow up. Jesus was calling for rebirth, followed by continued spiritual growth. Where am I going with all of this? Well, the challenge is twofold. If you have never arrived in Christ, if you've never given your life over to him, what are you waiting for? Eternity's on the line. And all you have to do is repent, admit that you're lost in this world and ask God to claim you, to name you, and let's throw a party. On the other hand, If you've already worn your party hat, if you've celebrated being found and accepted and embraced and loved by God unconditionally, don't cry over the fact that you're not the shiny new tool in the toolbox. And certainly don't get caught up trying to keep your party going on. No matter what physical season you are in, God can still use you to extend more invitations and to throw more parties. Friends, tools only have value when they are used and use tools. Don't stay shiny for long. Let God use you rather than working against him so that together we can throw more parties. For those of us who've already arrived in Christ, it's not about us anymore. It's about glorifying God and God is glorified when we let our own parties come to an end and get out of the way so that we can throw a party for someone else. My friends, the game of life is every bit as much about what happens in the end as it is about the process of getting to the end. In all of our comings and our goings and all of our arrivings and our taking leaves, God is seeking to help more people ensure that the game goes on 
when earthly life comes to an end. And in order to do that, we have to be reborn. We have to make room for God's spirit to dwell within us. And if we've already done that, we have to get over ourselves so that God can work through us to win more souls that have gone off the game board. And while a useful metaphor, life is not a game. It's very real, and the stuff we're dealing with has very real consequences and very real rewards. If you need the reward of a secured future and the hope of heaven, as I pray this morning, I want you to come forward. If you've given your life to Christ but have somehow lost your way and you need to come back to the flock, I want you to come forward. If you're trying to keep your party going and letting it and, and need help and letting it end, so that you can be freed to throw a party for someone else, come forward. Life is full of seasons. And if you need to arrive, come forward. If you feel as though you have arrived but haven't yet moved to the next stage, come forward. Life only works when we seek not only to be named and claimed by our Creator, but we must also seek to follow His will and His plan for our life. If you're lost in any way, come forward. Let me or one of our Hope Prayer partners, they're going to be up here too. Let us pray with you. Find your way or help someone else find theirs. Let's party. If you need to come forward, don't miss this opportunity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for naming and claiming us as your own. We thank you for seeking us when we lost our way. And we pray that you would help us to find our way back to you. Help us to celebrate our moments of arrival, but also to allow our own parties to end so that we may celebrate the arrival of others. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, um, many of you know, in May, I lost a dear friend and colleague in ministry, and uh, it was an unfortunate and an untimely death. But one of the things that Seth always used to say is that I love you, and God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. And I know that when God welcomed Seth into his arms in heaven, Seth was received with that warm and loving embrace that only God can give. My friends, if you are seeking to arrive in this world, God's love can fill those voids and those holes and those gaps in our lives like nothing else can. And if you have arrived, seek out those souls that are searching for that thing they have not yet found and share with them and show them how incredible the love of God can be. My friends, may God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you now, be with you in all of your moments of arrivals, and be with you always. We'll see you next week.